Mm. Okay, mm. we're live in three, two, one. Hi everyone, I hope things are going well for you. I'm Yi Sing, co-president of Cambridge Biosoc. Thank you very much for joining us for our penultimate talk uh, of this term. Before we start, here's a message from one of our sponsors, BitBio. Um, BitBio is founded by Dr. Mark Cotter and Florian Schuster, um, and it is an award-winning human synthetic biology enterprise. Its mission is to code cells for health, and to do so, they apply the principles of computation to biology. Their current focus is to develop a scalable technology platform capable of producing consistent batches of every human cell. We would also like to thank another sponsor, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an early stage genome editing company using CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenomic based therapies as well as providing educational resources. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Zhao Xiu, MBE, as our speaker. Um, Dr. Zhao Xiu got his PhD from the University of Cambridge in 1998, after which he joined the lab of Professor Sir Stephen O. Rahili, working on the genetics of severe human obesity. Giles is now a program leader at the, at the, the MRC Metabolic Diseases Unit in Cambridge, and his research currently focuses on the, influence, on the influences of genes on feeding behavior and body weight. In addition, he is a great, he's a graduate tutor and fellow of Wolfson College, an honorary, honorary president of the British Dietetic um, Association. Giles is also a broadcaster and author, presenting science documentaries for the BBC's Horizon and Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. His first book, Gene Eating, The Story of Human Appetite, was published in December 2018. Giles was appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire, MBE, for services to research and communication and, engage, and engagement in the Queen's 2020 birthday honours. Um, the talk will be followed by a Q&A session, which will be moderated by me, myself. Um, if you're on YouTube, feel free to ask your, to post your questions on the live chat throughout the talk. While if you're on Zoom, feel free to um, post your questions towards the, towards the end of the talk on the Zoom chat, or you could send them privately to me as well. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jiao to deliver his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yixing, and thank you people for, I, do you know, as I'm sharing the screen, um, you, all of you need to question your life decisions while you're here um, at, at six o'clock to listen to me instead of having a beer somewhere anyway so but you are and so I better entertain you because this is this is the this is part of the whole the whole process so my name is um, as you sing said my name is Jalzio I'm based here at the University of Cambridge and um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about whether or not obesity is a choice so stop don't before you even start listening to me stop throwing shoes at me stop so um, um, I, I will talk for about, I don't know, around 45 minutes, um, and I hope to convince you uh, um, of my argument, you know, that it actually isn't, that body weight actually isn't um, um, a choice at all. And then we'll see whether or not you believe my, my argument. So I'm a geneticist by trade. Um, this, is, this is what I did my undergrad in, this is what I did my PhD in. And I think genetic, um, being a geneticist is a perfectly upstanding thing to do. My mother-in-law still speaks to me, so this is a good thing. Um, but when people ask me what disease I study, and I say, or trait, and I say that I study body weight, of which obesity sits on one end of the spectrum, immediately I become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving fat people, overweight people, um, people living with obesity, terms I do not use in any pejorative fashion whatsoever, an excuse which I think philosophically has always been an interesting take for me because if I was studying the genetics of heart disease, the, gene the genetics of dementia, the genetics of cancer, would I suddenly be giving those people suffering from those diseases an excuse? No, right? I mean, I'd be trying to help them, trying to understand biology, you know, but yet when we're talking about body weight, when we're talking about obesity, suddenly I am giving people 
an excuse. And this is the reason why. So I think all of us have seen different versions of these scales of justice um, 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 pictures before, but this is otherwise known as the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so conservation of energy. You can't magic calories and energy into your body and you certainly can't magic the calories away. So the only way, the only way to gain weight, ladies and gentlemen, is to eat more than you burn. And ergo, the only way to lose weight is to burn more than you eat. And I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, eat less and move more. Is that what he just said? This is, this is what we signed up for? And yes, it is what you signed up for. And that's because it's the truth. It's physics. It's a fundamental law of physics. And we can't actually get past that. That being said, that is the how. Okay, so that is the how you actually get to the body weight you are, which is going to be physics. The question, however, is why? And in particular, why do people behave so very differently around food? Okay, so why do some people um, respond to stress by eating? Other people respond to stress by not eating. It's the, same, it's the same hormone. It's cortisol. Yet they're diametric opposite responses to it. Why do some people love their food? I love my food. Whereas other people use food as fuel. I, I've, I've shared an, um, an office space with a colleague of mine for the, the past decade. He eats the same damn cheese sandwich every single day of his life because he is a food as fuel person. Whereas I know what I'm going to have for dinner tomorrow night. I know what I'm going to have for dinner Sunday night. I even have plans for dinner Tuesday. I love food. I think about food. I actually make the food. What, what, why is that? Why do some people um, um, uh, uh, use food as reward? Why do some people find food uh, um, eating reward? Why do some people feel hungrier all of the time? So my point is all of these are different feeding behaviors. And what your different feeding behaviors, your behavior around food, your attitudes to food, it influences the physics, okay? So because of your different feeding behavior, you end up eating more or less, and you end up being a different size. So that is the nuance, ladies and gentlemen. And the why, our differences around how we actually behave around food, that is where, and that is, why, that is what is powerfully biologically influenced. And when we, and, and so here is uh, data, from the U.S. Center for Disease Control, and this is like a nerd's dream. Okay, this this um this this uh, table. So first of all, it's like a 6D data slide, right? So the the data, as I said, comes from the CDC, the U.S. CDC. It's data from 84 to 2014, and what you can see is you can see that there's time, there's males and females, and what is it's plotting BMI, body mass index, and the frequency of of of, of BMI, um in 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 a population over time. So now. Look, BMI is not perfect, and we can discuss why this might be later, but we know the numbers, right? So BMI 20 to 25 is considered normal weight. A BMI 25 to 30 is overweight, whereas above 30 is considered to be obese, okay? Now, if you actually took, therefore, the average BMI in 1984, with a way for to slap back, boom, okay? Then what you say that the average, what you see is that the average BMI for a male in 1984 is about 22 or 23. So normal weight, whereas the average BMI of someone in 2014, a man in 2014 or a female for that matter, is 27. It's overweight. So now let's go to the question of biological variation, genetic variation, which is what you're actually going to be thinking about. Can this change in body weight, in BMI over this period of time if which, for which I have been alive throughout the entire process? And most of you listening would have been alive for much of the process. Can it be down to our genes? So the answer, obviously, from that perspective is no. Okay, so the reason we, our genes haven't changed. They have not changed. Our genes have, have uh, this change has occurred against a, um, a, a static gene pool. Okay, so therefore, it is the change in environment, our lifestyle that has driven this obesity uh, problem that we're actually living in today. But, and this is the big but here, if it was only the environment they played a role with no biological variation at all, then what you would see is the 1984 histogram moving in its entirety upwards, right? So you end up with a shape that kind of looks like the Golden Gate Bridge, but that's not what you get. What you get is you, you get a shifting in shape of the histogram. And the only way, and assuming that all the data points, the human beings alive in 84 are still alive in 2014, then the only way you can change the shape of this histogram is where if everybody responds differently to the shifting environment. So what do we say in the field? We say in the field, well, why have we become more obese as a species, ladies and gentlemen? Because of the environment. But do we gain any weight at all? How, how much weight do we gain? Where do we sit 
on the distribution of body weight population wise, that is powerfully biologically um, influenced. And when we talk about biology, as I said, we have to talk about genes. Now, what is the evidence that, that uh, there is a powerful genetic um, component to, to body weight? As with many other human traits, a lot of this was actually worked out in twins. Okay, so now just to briefly phrase twin studies for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, they are clearly identical twins, monozygotic twins, and non-identical twins, so dizygotic twins. Now, identical twins are, for all intents and purposes, genetic clones of each other. They share a hundred percent of genetic material, whereas non-identical twins would share as much genetic material as you would with your own siblings, or for that matter, your parents, fifty percent. So, if you study enough twins, you can ask the question about what percentage of a given trait, the heritability of a given trait, is going to be down to your genes versus the environment? So just a couple of examples, okay? If I had hair, my hair would be black. And hair color, I want to argue, is powerfully biologically, genetically influenced with very little environmental impact. Dyeing your hair does not count. I'm talking about your natural hair color. Now let's take another trait, okay? Freckles. Now freckles are clearly going to have a powerful genetic influence. But whether or not they appear, how many appear, even amongst identical twins, would entirely depend on whether or not um, I wear t-shirts. Do I like to stand in the sun? So there, we have a genetically influenced trait with an equally powerful environmental influence. Okay? So as it turns out, every single human trait and behavior, every single human trait and behavior will have a genetic influence. The trick is to figure out what role the environment plays. Why is it a trick? Because the genes are in effect static. You can measure them, they're the same the day you're born and until the day you die, okay? You can measure them whenever you want and they'll stay, they'll stay pretty much the same. The environment, however, is volatile and changes every minute of every day, okay? So what is the role of the environment uh, playing in all these given traits? Now, if you actually do that maths, then what you've re realized is that the heritability of body weight is actually 70%. So it's not zero, it's not 100%, but it's pretty damn high. So to put things in perspective, the heritability of height, which no one here would, I presume, would um, argue that it is, uh, is not uh, a genetically influenced, the heritability of height the heritability of height is around 85%. So the heritability of body weight is approaching, certainly approaching that of height. And the first genetic handle, the first actual molecular handle that we had, that body weight and, and the regulation of food intake is not just down to willpower, was the discovery and identification of a molecule called leptin. And this mouse here, who's twice the weight of these two uh, over here, has a mutation in this gene called, called leptin. And this mouse is called the obese mouse. Very unimaginative, but that's the name, uh, the name of this mouse. It was discovered in the 50s in the Jackson Labs in Maine in the United States. Um, but the, the genetic um, etiology of it, why this mouse is so obese because of a mutation in leptin was identified in 1994 by the lab of Jeffrey Friedman at the Rockefeller University in New York. So what is leptin? Leptin is a fat hormone. It secretes it uh, into the bloodstream from fat and reflects the amount of fat we actually have on ourselves. Okay, now this is an important piece of information Okay, because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. Okay, not a problem today. We have too much food, but clearly a problem in the past when there wasn't in, uh, wasn't enough food. So it's an important integer to hold in your head. Leptin circulates in the blood and signals to the brain, allowing your brain therefore to influence um, um to, to 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 influence food. So I guess there was a, a a question that was then asked about. Actually, hang on a second, guys. Just. I want to make sure that I'm in the right um, presentation. Sorry, guys. Just let me see. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure, make sure that we were talking talking about the the right thing. Okay. So, so then. Uh, it was at this point, actually, that my current head of department, Professor Sir Stephen O'Ratley, actually came on the scene, um, and which uh, this would have been the late '90s, in which he was asking, okay, well, if there was one mammalian species the mouse, which had a naturally occurring mutation. So that mouse had a naturally occurring mutation. It wasn't a genetically modified animal, um, resulting in severe obesity. You know, is this more applicable uh, uh, widely? So now, is, was this a weird mousey thing? It could have been a weird mousey thing because mice are very different from humans. But the bottom line is um, um, Steve O'Ratley and his at the time um, clinical fellow, 
now Professor Faruqi, um, Sadaf Faruqi, then looked. And to cut a long story short, they did find human beings with congenital leptin deficiency, with, mu with mutations in the same gene that caused the obesity in, in, in the mouse, but uh, um, these are just separate mutations. And so these, these are children without this fat hormone called leptin. So what do they look like? Well, you can see what they look like over here. Um, they're of normal birth weight, but then they become hyperphagic after weaning. So hyper for more, phagic for eat with no food preference. Now, hyperphagia, just to be clear, is a pathogenic term. You can't say, oh, I was hyperphagic last night. No, you won't. You just ate too much. Hyperphagia is a pathological um, behavior around food. These kids have to have their freezer doors locked up because they'll go in and actually eat frozen food. Okay. It does sound a bit ew, I guess, um, until I come back uh, in the next slide and actually give you a scenario in which it's not actually as odd as, as, as it actually might seem. Now, there's other, you can read everything here. There's no defect in BMR or energy expenditure. There's a tremendous increase in fat mass. They're of normal height, but they don't undergo puberty and have an impaired immune function, which seems two odd things to be talking about within an obesity context. But um, these final two uh, phenotypes, which I've listed here, really give us an, an, an idea about the biological role of leptin, okay? And I'm going to come back to that. Now, as I mentioned, here's a, here's a closer look at the child, uh, the younger child. This is a three-year-old. This is the younger boy, three-year-old weighing 42 kilograms, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Times 2.2 for pounds divided by 14 for stone. Perspective, I'm five foot nine. Okay, and I weigh 75 kilograms. So this is a three-year-old who weighs two-thirds of my body weight. Just in case you needed any reminder, this is not normal chubbiness, PlayStation, a bit too much Coca-Cola. This child has a monogenic effect, has a single gene defect, which causes his, his obesity. Now, leptin, as I mentioned, is a hormone secreted from fat. So Steve, Steve Ratley once again asked the question, if you take type one diabetes as an analogy where you lack insulin and you can inject yourself daily with insulin in order to manage your glucose homeostasis. Steve then thought, well, could you inject this child with leptin daily and manage his fat homeostasis? And to cut another very long story short, you could. So this is the same child now, seven years old, weighing 32 kilograms. And the only difference, okay, aside from time, is that this child has daily injections of leptin, much like you would deliver insulin, like with a little insulin pen, the child delivers leptin in a, in a little, little leptin um, pen. Now, at the time, the, the patent, while the patent for leptin was held by the Rockefeller University, which was where it was discovered, it was licensed to the American pharmaceutical giant, Amgen. And to have been a fly on the wall when this data had come in, they must they must have wet themselves because they thought that they cured, they finally cured obesity. We have cured obesity forever. We're going to be rich beyond our imagination, except they hadn't. So look at when this paper was published um, by, by Sadaf Faruqi and Steve Ratley. 1999, um, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, So we are in, last I checked, 2021, 22 years ago. And leptin is certainly not the panacea for curing obesity. Okay, And it's not like Amgen didn't try, just to be clear. Amgen gave leptin to... Um, people of all ages, uh, men, women, people of all colors. And there was a universal truth that emerged. If you had a functioning leptin system, this child does not have a functioning leptin system. But if you, if you had a functioning leptin system, then it didn't matter whether or not you had a BMI of, had a, a supermodel with BMI of 18, okay? Or you look like Santa Claus, okay? Additional leptin did not influence your food intake. Now, the question is why? Okay, given that if you didn't have leptin, that you was exquisitely sensitive to, to, to the effects of leptin. Well, I think you have to think about the actual biological role of leptin. When leptin was first discovered, everybody thought that it was a negative feedback loop. Too much fat, lots of leptin, leptin signals to the brain, makes you eat less, you have less fat. Okay, This was the, the, the role. Except when in evolution would we have needed a whole physiological mechanism to be put together to stop us from gaining too much fat, right? Because we never had enough food. It, it would never have had the, had the selection pressure to evolve. So that is not leptin's role. What leptin, as it turns out, leptin's role is not to function when there's loads of it sloshing about in the blood, letting you know you have too much fat. It functions when it disappears to let your brain know when you don't have enough fat. 
When don't you have enough fat? When you're starving. Leptin's role is, as it disappears, to turn on the starvation response. So let us think about this. So what is the starvation response? Well, the first obvious one is to eat. Now, all of us know, we, we go through this every day, <clears throat> that if you are really hungry, really, really hungry, then the simplest foods taste the best. A little piece of bread, maybe some cheese, maybe a bit of rice. Mm, delicious. But the fuller you become, the more picky you become with your food. Okay, This is something we go through every single day. We understand this phenomenon. But imagine if you were starving, actually starving, plane crash in the Andes, your partner is looking delicious starving. Would you end up eating frozen fish fingers? to keep yourself alive. Yes, of course you would. So as it turns out, all living creatures become hyperphagic when they are starving, okay? In order to keep themselves alive. They don't eat poison. We're not gonna eat poisonous food because that'd kill us, okay? But we will eat foods that would be considered unpalatable under normal circumstances. So in spite of this poor child's body habitus, he has a brain who thinks he is starving and eats as such. The other thing which happens is your brain begins to triage calories, in particular glucose, for, the, uh, for itself. Your brain is 2 to 3% of your body weight, okay? Um, but at rest, now, for example, it uses up 25% of the circulating glucose in the blood because it's metabolically hideously expensive. And so what it does is it begins to triage calories for itself so that even in your haze of hunger, it's able to put together a cogent strategy in order to track down, in order to track down food. Okay, so how does it do that? It begins to tune down or shut off metabolically expensive, but immediately unimportant, um, um, immediately unimportant pathways. And reproduction is one of them. Okay, where ladies, we know that at that time of the month, loads of wasted calories. Now, at the edge of starvation, those wasted calories can be the difference between life and death. So your brain shuts off the whole system. It doesn't, okay, it doesn't leave you the chance. And anyway, if you were actually starving, actually starving, then the last thing you're going to want to do is to prop a baby out under the Serengeti, right? Because you're not going to be able to feed the baby. So reproduction is turned off. The other thing which is very expensive is the immune system. Now you might say, well, if you turn it down, I'll die of an infection. This is triage, ladies and gentlemen. You'll die of starvation before you die of an infection. So your brain tunes it all down. But the beauty of the whole part of system is it's fully reversible. Because when you give back leptin, the child normalizes his body weight because he normalizes his feeding behavior. The hyperphagia disappears. How about reproduction? His older cousin, remember this is 1999, is now in her 30s. She has a family. She's the first leptin deficient living being in all of evolution to carry a baby to term, to have a family because of daily injections of leptin. Immune system, I haven't shown you the data, that's also been fixed. So that is leptin's role to indicate starva a state of starvation and to, ad and to get your body to adapt to the state of starvation to make sure you keep yourself alive. Now, so leptin, as I said, um, is a uh, hormone that circulates in the blood. So what happens, and, and signals to the brain, what happens when it hits the brain? Well, when it hits the brain, we, oh, sorry, we now understand based on this studies of, 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 of leptin, of a circulating hormone signaling to the brain of how the brain controls food intake. Okay, this is very simplistic. Your brain needs to know two pieces of information, as it turns out, <clears throat> in order to control food intake. It needs to know how much fat you have for all the reasons I've explained. Okay, but it also needs to know what you have just eaten and what you're currently eating. Okay, so these are your short term signals. And these hormonal signals are going to come from your gut, your gastrointestinal tract. So these are the short-term signals. And so what happens is these short-term and long-term signals, which are all in the blood, signal to the brain, and your brain responds and translates these signals and then influences your next interaction with a, uh, a, a restaurant menu, uh, a refrigerator, or the, super, or the supermarket. But there are, like with the leptin, um, genetic modifiers that run throughout the entire process that we have been able to harness and really begin to understand the biology of these pathways controlling food intake. And I'll focus the rest of the talk just on this one pathway. It's called the leptin melanocortin pathway. Okay. And leptin melanocortin pathway is leptin from fat. We talked about this, but signals to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Within the within the hypothalamus, there's a population of neurons called the POMC neurons. Um, and leptin uh, uh, results in the processing of these neurons to a number of different peptides, which then signal to the melanocortin-4 receptor, okay, therefore influencing food intake. This is the leptin melanocortin uh, um, um, signaling pathway. How do we know it's important? 
We know it's important because disruption at every single stage of this process, and I'm only going to give you one or two examples, every single stage of this process results in severe obesity, whether or not you have whiskers in the tail or not. Okay, and I'm going to try and just highlight a couple of these examples to show you and to add to my um, um, so thesis that that obesity is not actually that body weight actually is 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 not a choice. Now, for the POMC, and let's start with that. I can show you data of on humans and and pictures of human beings with mutations, and they look like um, the leptin deficient human beings, but with bright red hair. Um, I could show you the mice where we, we created genetically modified mice with the POMC knocked out. But what I'll show you is our work on Labrador retrievers. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Labradors are the most popular pet dogs um, um, in the UK and in North America. Okay, And that's because they have a lovely, wonderful temperament. Now, this work is led by a... Um, a veterinary surgeon colleague, and is still led by a veterinary surgeon colleague of mine, Eleanor Raffin, who is now a lecturer down at PDN um, um, uh, in, in, in town. Okay, And she was, at, now Labradors have a wonderful uh, temperament. They're wonderful family dogs, but any of you who own Labradors know you have to keep your compost bin shut because the Labrador will eat everything that's actually, that's actually there. They're tremendously food motivated. Okay, And um, Eleanor was interested, why? And so to cut a long, another long story short, many long stories cut it very short, um, the Labrador, a percentage of Labrador retrievers have a deletion in POMC. And this gene I was telling you about that leptin actually turns on, okay? Now, not all Labradors have it. So we can do a genotype phenotype correlation. And so this is body weight. And what you can see is, this is these are wild type Labradors. These are Labradors with one copy of the deletion. And these are Labradors with two copies of the deletion, homozygous deletion. And you can see that, as with each copy of the deletion, you actually gain about a couple of kilograms of weight, the dog does, um, so that the homozygous Labradors with the deletion are on average four kilos heavier than the wild type Labradors. Doesn't sound like a lot, but Labradors only get to about 33 to 34 kilos. So four kilograms is a lot of dog. And when you do food motivation and actually look at that, then what you see is you see exactly the same shape. So these are increasing levels of food motivation in the presence of this deletion therefore probably driving the, the, the body weight, the body weight phenotype. So these are the scores on the door, so to speak. It's a 1.9, a couple of kilos per deletion allele or 0.3 of a standard deviation of body weight. But that is not the end of the, of, of the story. Um, as I said, not all Labradors have it. About 20 to 25% of Labradors will carry this deletion, but actually 75, three quarters of Labradors don't. And 95% of Labradors are tremendously food motivated. And Eleanor is now throwing the genetic book at this to try and find out what the other drivers are. But, um, but POMC clearly is a key driver in, 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 its, in its feeding behavior. Now, the other thing about Labradors is that they are very, very trainable. So in addition to their lovely temperament, they're amazingly trainable dogs. So much so that they're primarily used as guide dogs for the blind, okay? Particularly in North America and in the UK. And now guide dogs for the blind are like the Navy SEALs of the dog world, okay? And that's because they're trained within an inch of their life because they're about to be given a human life to look after for the rest of their life. And there's a huge failure, okay? So dogs get, get sent into training camp, boot camp, um, and then they fail. And when they fail, they become pets. But the few, the proud, the guide dogs are trained with food using standard Pavlovian training behaviors, okay? And so with this huge selection pressure of selecting guide dogs, when we looked at our cohort of guide dog Labradors, 80%... Okay, nearly 80% of the Labrador guide dogs had this deletion in POMC. So because they're more food motivated and because they're selected and trained with food. So here's the concept. So here is the guide dog, okay, bringing back visually impaired Mr. Smith. Okay, just, 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 just for example, let me take off my glasses. Visually impaired Mr. Smith. Now, imagine if a chicken suddenly ran across the road. Could happen. What are the chances of a chicken dinner for the guide dog? 50-50, 80-20, doesn't matter. Okay, because the guide dog is trained that it will have a 100% chance of dinner if he brings back Mr. Smith home safely. So we started off by studying um, um, food motivation. And suddenly, because of how a selection pressure has been applied, moved on to, to, to tackling something as complicated as trainability. We ended up in a, uh, in a cover of the, of the uh, journal. This is Jasper, one of the participants, and this is Eleanor, who, who actually leads the study. So for those of you who have Labradors and go back and you think, oh, Fido loves me with the big googly eyes. 
Fido doesn't love you. He's hungry. <sighs> Terrible thing to say. Terrible thing to say. Now, then, as I said, POMC is processed and then signals to the melanocortin-4 receptor, leptin melanocortin signaling pathway. And now you'll be unsurprised to know that a mutation in the MC4, mutations in the MC4 receptor will result in dominantly inherited severe human obesity, okay? Um, and this is work that I did as my, uh, in my first postdoc. So this is published in, 19, um, in 1998. But not only does it actually make you um, um, more, more obese, it also changes the way you eat. So this is just laboratory work here on the left-hand side, which I did um, um, in the early 2000s. Whereas on the right-hand panel over here, this is the measure of food intake done by my colleague, Professor Faruqi, in a clinical research lab. So with, uh, uh, we now know that mutations in the MC4 receptor are the commonest monogenic single gene cause of, of, um, of obesity that, that we actually know. So there are thousands of different mutations out there. Now with so many thousands, there are gonna be some mutations that are more severe here that completely kill the receptor, whereas there are other receptors, mutations, which only partially uh, uh, um, re partially makes the, makes the receptor partially functional, anywhere from 30 to 70% functional. So this is work that was done with recombinant protein in a tissue culture hood somewhere in a lab somewhere. Okay, and I don't, I'm a reductionist, I'm not a medic. And, and whereas the clinical research was done in the clinical research facility, okay? And what you can see here, is that this is a measure of food intake, okay? And you can see that um, the, the red bar, so there's leptin deficiency, there's lots of eating. This is a buffet meal scenario, 3,000 ca uh, calorie meal, okay? Uh, uh, and see how much everything is measured in and out. And here's treated leptin deficiency. And you can see that with the treatment of leptin, you get an immense drop off in the amount of food that's eaten. Now, all of the MC4 deficient kids that were coming in uh, were analyzed as they came in and were studied as they came in. They were only split into these two different into these two different bars when I provided Sadaf, Professor Faruqi, with the lab-based studies. So the bottom line is in a test tube, petri dish tissue culture test that we're able to do, based on the level of dysfunction of a receptor, we were able to predict the amount of food that a person was likely to eat in a free living well, in a buffet scenario. So what this told us is that leptin, is that the MC4 receptor is not binary. It's not on and off. It was a rheostat, it's a tunable system, okay? Now I mentioned that um, um, mutations in the MC4 receptor are the commonest uh, you know, cause of, of, um, of obesity. So how common, okay? So this is what we just literally, it's just impressed, just came out, we just ex got accepted last, uh, last week, a week before last in which we went to study and look at MC4 in, the, in this uh, um, cohort called the Avon Longitudinal Study of, of Parents and Children. So this is the ALSPEC study, and it's a Bristol-based study, and it's a birth cohort. So everyone um, um, that was born within, I think, the year between 92 and 93 around the Bristol area would have been recruited, okay? Not, not everyone would have said yes, not everyone would have been recruited, but it, it was unselective. Okay, and so it's a cohort of about 12,000 12, participants. We screened the MC4 receptor in about half of the cohort and found pathogenic mutations in one in 337. Now remember, these are unrelated participants. This is the general population we're looking at here. So one in about 300 or 0.3% of the population will carry loss of function mutations in the MC4 receptor. If you scale that up to the whole population of the UK, that is 200,000 people in this country, okay, with mutations in, in, in the melanocortin-4 in the melanocortin four receptor. And what you see is if you actually take a child at 18 years and look at the mean difference in carriers versus, versus non-carriers, there is nearly a difference of nearly 18 kilograms of weight, okay, at 18 years old between someone carrying an MC4 mutation versus someone not carrying an MC4 mutation. 18 kilograms is a lot of weight, ladies and gentlemen, to, to point to, uh, that's nearly 40 pounds, okay? That is a lot of difference. And if you look at the data over here, because this is a birth cohort and these kids were actually studied um, at, at, at times as they go through from zero years old all the way to 18, you can track, you can track their growth curves, okay? And so the dark blue, uh, um, are the carriers of the mutation. The, the middle color blue are the heterozy, um, are the, sorry, let me start this again. So what we've now done is we've split the, the, um, the mutations into mutations which kill the receptor entirely, complete loss of function, 
and and mutations that only partially affect the uh, uh, affect the function of the receptor, like like I did in, um, um, in 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 the previous slide. And what you can see is that the dark blue are those patients are those patients are those people carrying the the fully dead one copy of a fully dead MC4 receptor. The ones in the middle blue are ones that are carrying the partially ac active receptor, whereas the one in the lightest blue, right at the bottom, are the ones that don't carry any mutations at all. And you can see that the difference occurs relatively early on in age and then and then begins to separate out and you can see that the difference is going to be in uh, amount of fat it's going to be um uh both in fat mass at 10 10 years old at 14 years old and at 18 years old so 0.3 percent of the population so this is not it's not common super common but it is not certainly not rare and less you think by the way i talk about humans a lot obviously um, that this is some weird human-y thing, the, um, the leptin melanocortin pathway. Um, it isn't, okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll get to that. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But in terms of now treatment, okay, treatment for so many different people with these um, with, with, with these mutation, we now have potential treatments that are that are actually out there. Okay, so in the middle of 2016, um, the group of, of Peter Kunin and Heiko Kruder um, tested a, a compound from Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, okay, which is a, which is a, a pharmacy derived agonist and signals to the MC4 receptor for weight loss. And what they did was they tested this on two patients with no POMC. Okay, so these are kids with mutations in POMC. And you can see what I mean by the severe obesity. So this is the same, this is the same gene that causes the obesity in the Labradors. And what you see is patient one with no POMC is that at 18 years old, there are 160 kilograms. Okay, and patient two is at 150 kilograms. And these kids are then treated with this drug, set melanotide. And what you see is that over 42 weeks of treatment, patient one lost 50 kilograms, ladies and gentlemen, of weight, okay, in 42 weeks. And in 12 weeks for the patient two, this patient lost 22 kilograms of weight. Right, such pharmaceutically ass assisted weight loss has not the dramatic nature of this has not been seen since the original leptin deficient kids were treated with leptin, and so it has really, really energized the field, and it's now in um, uh, in trials for tests of other uh, uh, rare causes of obesity, although not for common obesity yet. Okay, but there is hope out there for potential treatments in targeting people carrying mutations. Um, um, within this receptor, within this pathway. Remembering again, 200,000 people potentially in this country will carry mutations in the MC4 receptor. Now, back to the thing about whether or not it's a human specific thing. It isn't, okay? The moment now you begin looking more broadly at other m mammals that, care, that, that have a leptin melanocortin pathway, you begin to see that depending on the selection pressure that is applied, Okay, mutations within the MC4 receptor is used as a tool in order to select for feeling behavior. So let me give you one example, pig breeding. I, I, when I first published that first, when I published that first paper in 1998 with the mutation, I was out there giving a talk and this lady approached me uh, at a conference when we could go to conferences. This lady approached me after the talk and, um, and it turns out she was from a pig breeding company. And she said that, oh, you know, we saw your paper and we ended up screening some of our pigs. Now, this particular pig, not this one, this is just a random picture of a pig, but these pigs that they were studying grew faster by themselves. So in other words, they just, they were selected for, for pace, for rate of growth without any growth hormone injections, okay? They just got, they got bigger uh, with, a, with a favorable fat to lean mass ratio. And these pigs, which make particularly good bacon, apparently, have mutations within the MC4 receptor. So this is human selection selecting for rate of growth. Now, lest you think this is a mammalian specific thing, no, nope. please let me introduce you to the blind Mexican cave fish. Mm -hmm. So not only are they fish, they're blind. Not only are they blind, they're Mexican. So these are boring fish with eyes and they can see very passe. And these are the blind Mexican cave fish. So why are they Mexican and why are they blind? So um, the big asteroid, the big dinosaur killing asteroid that slammed into Earth hit around the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so when it went in there, it then put cracks in the mantle and the crust, which then underwater cracks, which then caves filled in with water and became underwater caves. And some fish got stuck in these caves. 
and these are underwater and dark. And because they were dark, there's no light, these fish became, the, the eyes evolved away because they didn't need, they didn't need the light. The second interesting thing about this, being stuck in an underwater dark cave, is that there's very little food in there. And every so often, the tide might blow in some plankton or something like that. Now, any fish, any of these blind Mexican cave fish that were in any way blasé about the food floating by, died, okay, because there was not enough food. They needed to be driven enough to, to get the food to actually keep themselves alive, okay? So much so that all of the blind Mexican cave fish around today have mutations in the melanocotin photoreceptor because these are the fish that were food motivated enough to keep them alive in this weird low food environment that, that was there, okay? So I guess this is my question. Where, where is the choice? Given the right selection pressure that is there, this is a pig, okay? The, the, the choice that was, was human beings were just choosing for someone that the pigs that grew faster. Where's the choice for this blind Mexican cave fish? There's no choice, okay? Due to a selection pressure, there was an altered hard wiring in a brain in order to make sure that the fish were actually able to survive, okay? The Labradors, okay, were... were, were originally uh, bred to be fishermen's do dogs, to jump into the cold waters in order to pull back fishermen's nets. Okay, so the first dog, Dog Zero, probably was slightly tubby and was willing to work for treats. And so the fishermen then ended up, Canadian fishermen ended up breeding from these dogs, therefore selecting and then training the mutations within it. Where's the choice, ladies and gentlemen? Now, lest you think this is my last uh, uh, um, Dr. Um, um, Livingston example, okay, of actually uh, a a um, evolutionary tour through all, all, all number of different uh, animals is can we make fruit flies flat, fat? Now, as a, as a result, as a, a interesting thing, we can, okay? So these are fruit flies, Drosophila. These are the kind of flies that um, turn up when your bananas go brown. And, and we have an assay that we have. We call it the cafe assay. And so what we, it's a capillary. You can see, this is what I show here. So this is a capillary. And what fruit flies like to eat are sugar and yeast. That is their that is their, their source food. Okay, so it's liquid, and so you can actually fill each of these capillaries with sugar and yeast, and then put a dot of food dye at the top at the meniscus, and then as long as you mark it, and you can put a number of flies in a in a um, in a tube, you can then measure the rate of, of of food consumption, right, millimeters over time. So what happens here? ND stands for uh, a normal diet. And this is if they're on a normal diet, the food's down here. Then the, the flies eat food, eat the um, yeast, the yeast sugar uh, solution at a specific rate. Okay. Now, what happens when you fast the flies? You get to remove food for 24 hours and then put them in this scenario. They eat more food. Okay. They begin to actually eat more food. And what happens if you put the flies on a high fat diet, such as it is for a fly? They eat less because they're going, oh man, I'm full. Okay, so, so using this feeding behavior paradigm, we're then able to screen for, for, for genes for feeding behavior in flies. Now, why am I telling you any, any of this? I won't, I won't bore you with, with this. I'm telling you this because while flies do not have a melanocortin pathway per se, they have one of the proteins which processes POMC. Okay, it's called PCSK1. And what it does is it splits POMC up into the signaling molecules which signal to the MC4 receptor. And when you actually delete it, from a fly within the brain, you end up with a fat fly. You end up with a fly that eats more, okay, and, 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 and weighs more. These are flies, ladies and gentlemen. Oops, I've killed a fly. Where's the choice? There isn't a choice, okay? These are hardwired behaviors that are actually there. So now everything I've talked to you about the last uh, five minutes, okay? maybe five or six minutes. Um, everything I've spoken to you about today is about monogenic obesity. So in other words, single gene defects causing a change in feeding behavior. But aside from the case, okay, there's 200,000 people in this, in, this, in this country with mutations in the MC4 receptor. Actually, the majority of us are the body weights we are not because of single gene defects, but because of polygenic effects, okay? Multiple, uh, uh, multiple genes, each having subtle effects. And so we now know a bit about the a genetic architecture of, of the um, common obesity um, using genome-wide association studies. Now, this Jackson-Pollock diagram here um, shows two large groups of genes, and you don't have to look at the individuals here. So the, 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 the group, the genes in pink up here, as it turns out, represents your waist to hip ratio. So this is the circumference of your waist over the circumference of your hip. And if you look at that, you realize it's indicating body shape, 
do I have a big bum versus a small tummy? Do I have a big tummy versus a small bum? Do I look like a sausage? Okay. So it is where you put your fat. The genes in blue down here, however, this book, big blob of blue genes, these have to do with just simply your BMI, independent of where you put your fat. This is how much fat you have. Two messages I wanted you to take away from this, from this slide, from this Jackson Pollock diagram. First, where you put your fat, at least genetically, has very little to, to do with how much fat you have. Okay, But that's the first thing, Dis genetically distinct. These genes, where you put your fat, as it turns out, have to do with genes that take that indicate fat biology. They're present in fat. Okay, so where you put your fat has to do with fat. That sounds like it makes sense. Whereas how much fat you have, these genes in blue down here, they where we know their function function within the brain, brain function within the brain to influence feeding behavior. This is another way of looking at the data. Okay, this is known as a Manhattan plot, and it's a Manhattan plot because it looks like the skyline of Manhattan. Now, this gene here, FTO, I have spent the last 14 years of my life studying. This is the first time I've mentioned it. Why? Because it's a very sad story, and I don't want to share sad stories tonight, other than to tell you that these are not mutations. Now we're not looking at mutations. Half of you, half of you listening to me tonight will carry one copy of the risk factor for FTO, half of you, which makes you, on average, a kilo and a half heavier than someone who doesn't have it. One sixth of you, or about a billion people in the world, will carry two copies of the risk factor for FTO, making you on average three kilograms heavier, on average, three kilograms heavier than someone who doesn't carry it, and 50% more likely to become obese over your lifetime. So these are not mutations. All of you will carry a mix of these different genes that are here. So what are these, uh, or what are these genes and variations? I've just highlighted two. There we have POMC of Labrador, um, um, of Labrador fame, okay? And there we have the MC4 receptor of, of the pigs and of the blind Mexican cavefish, okay? So what we now know, these are genes of the leptin melanocortin pathway. What we now know is that severe mutations of the leptin melanocortin pathway results in severe obesity and a big phenotype. Whereas very subtle changes, these are polymorphisms, subtle changes in exactly the same genes and pathways okay, influences where you end up sitting on the normal distribution of body weight. And you can now make these things called um, polygenic risk scores, okay, where if you add up all of the different, because we now know of over a thousand genes that actually are linked to body weight, okay, so you can add up the number of these risk factors you have, and then actually plot it against BMI, and you get a linear relationship, such as the more of these variations you have, the more he the heavier you are likely to, uh, um, to, to be. This, begs, this does beg the question of whether or not we can uh, pick people with a high genetic risk and intervene and actually do something about it before they actually become obese. Um, and the answer is no, certainly not yet. And that is because, and this doesn't stop people from trying. This is 23andMe, for example, who are trying to predict whether or not people will become fat, for example. Um, but the problem with um, um, these data that we see is that these, these are population risk factors rather than individual predictions. Okay, so these companies all make a, uh, a fundamental error in misunderstanding the use of population level risk factors and using it as an individual predictor for your body weight. And you, we can't do this yet. It's one risk factor, um, but it is, does not explain and does not predict necessarily if you're going to um, become obese or not. So am I giving anyone any excuse? I guess this is the, this is the, big, this is the big question. Okay. Um, look, I'll give you two analogies. The first analogy is that you go to consider your hands like your genes like a hand of poker. And you can have good hands, you can have bad hands, and the only people you can blame are your parents because that's where you got your genes from. But you can win with a bad hand of poker. It is just more difficult. Let me give you another example. I will never, ever run as fast as Usain Bolt, ever. Okay, And I, that's because of my genes. I'm sticking to it. That's the reason why. But it doesn't mean that if I train, I won't run faster than I do now. People misunderstand what genetics is and means. They think that it gives you a point in space and time. They think it determines who you are. And that's not true. Your genetics certainly bracket a set of possibilities. Okay? Why am I bald? Because of my genes. Why do I look Chinese? Because of my genes. But within that bracket of possibilities, you can move up 
you can move down, you can move sideways, you can you you, you can change depending on the environment, depending on your lifestyle, depending on how rich or poor you are, depending on your diet, you commute, depending on any number of different things. Geneticists are just trying to find out the bracket of possibilities to so that people can actually do something um, um, with this with this information. And I will skip this so that I can I can actually take questions. So I guess are we sinners? Um, and I use the word sinner on purpose, okay? Because whenever we talk about food, we talk about sin, don't we? We talk about Mr. Gluttony. We talk about any number of things. Sin is something which you purpose, you make a bad decision. You make a choice to sin. This is, this is the whole point. And this is me choosing to eat a pizza. And, and I, the answer is no, because, because it's not a choice. And let's go back to this thing. Is body weight a choice? Is obesity a choice? And you're thinking, well, of course it's a choice. You're the one sticking the damn pizza in your mouth. Look, Here's the, I, it might seem like a choice because it's a binary decision, each meal. But please remember this. Any given meal is not going to make you gain or lose weight. We do not gain or lose weight over one meal or overnight. The body weight which we are at is a function of thousands of different feeding decisions that have happened over the last few years. Now imagine because of your genetic hand of cards, okay, that you are 5% less likely to say no. 5%. 5% over thousands of different feeding decisions, less likely to say no, is hundreds of thousands of additional calories eaten, okay? Which is why some people are small, medium, and large in the environment we live in. Taken over the period of time that we need to shift our body weight, body weight, our feeding behavior is not a choice. This is me choosing to eat a broccoli. So people living with obesity are not bad, they're not lazy. They're not morally bereft. They are fighting their biology. It doesn't change the physics. I'm not trying to change physics. The only way to lose weight is still to eat less. But until we as a society understand that for some people, it will always be more difficult to say no, okay? We will never be able to put together a lasting and sustainable strategy to solve the epidemic of diet-related illnesses that we're actually living in today. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank my colleagues, Stephen O'Reilly, Tony Cole, um, the guys that did a lot of the work. I'm based at the MRC Metabolic Diseases Unit. I'm funded by the MRC, the BBSRC. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to listen to me bang on about things. But otherwise, it's been a pleasure to speak to all of you. Thank you ever so much. I'm going to stop sharing now. Rock and roll, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to take some questions. I'm sorry I went a bit long. Thank you very much, Dr. Giles, you for his very captivating yet um, engaging and accessible talk to, uh, I think there are quite a lot of um, people from the general public here, besides just students um, from Cambridge. So um, yes, um, I'll be taking questions from both the YouTube chat and from the Zoom chat. Uh, like I said, feel free to post the uh, questions on the chat or you could send the questions privately to me as well. Um, we have three questions in the chat. Okay, yes, that's a very long one. But, um, right, but I'll just read the question so that everyone, including those on YouTube can... Um, Okay, so the first one is, what proportion of people living with obesity in the population are more influenced by genetic factors related to leptin or more influenced by genetic and environmental factors influencing things like ability to delay gratification? Ah, okay, so I understand that question. Uh, that's, a very, that's, a very good, that's a very good question. So, so um, like I said, there are over a thousand genes now. Um, that we know that are linked to, to, to our body weight. And all of us have some mix of this. And, um, and all of us have our unique mix of it, some of which will lie within the leptin signaling pathway. Um, can I put a number on it? I don't think we can as yet, although I'm sure we can go and actually crunch the numbers. We know, as I said, that around 200,000 people will have mutations, mutations in a melanocortin-4 receptor. So that's the kind of number, 0.3% because of the MC4 receptor. But Everyone else will have their own mix, including, you're right, whether or not you are more uh, or less 
whether or not you consider food more or less rewarding, whether or not you feel more or less full, which is very different from being whether or not you feel more or less hungry, I just want to point out, um, and, and, and everywhere in between. Um, so the answer is we don't, I can't give you an exact number, but they're going to be, because all of us have, um, because all of us have our individual mix of genes, they're not going to be any, any easy pigeonholing of people. We're all going to have a full spectrum of behaviors, depending on what different mix of individual genes we are uh, and variations we actually have. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple. There are a few more questions. Um, perhaps um, while there's while there is clearly very little choice in hum many human decisions, calling into questions uh, calling into question concepts like free will, there are also those who have unhealthy eating habits, less due to genetics and more due to social and cultural influences from childhood resulting in less ability to delay gratification. But is that understanding also misleading based on your research or does your research not cover the entire population in terms of obesity? No, 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 no. So, so, so in terms of body weight, this has now been studied in multiple populations um, um, and these thousand genes that were in multiple different countries over multiple ethnicities. Okay, so this spectrum of response to food is a universal human trait. Now it's interesting. The delayed gratification, okay? So remember, when, when I'm talking about the heritability of body weight, I did, it's not 100%. It's gonna be, it's not just purely 70%. It's actually between 40 and 70%, okay? It's heritability of body weight. But you can then flip that around. You can say that actually, therefore, between 30 and 60% have to do with the environment. And that will then influence how uh, it would just, it, it would then influence how your genetics uh, um, um, expresses expresses itself. So culture is going to form one 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 of those things. Um, whether or not you're exposed to certain foods as a kid, that is going to be one of the learning elements that, that that is there. How poor you are. So for example, we have a very uncomfortable link between um, privilege, between socioeconomic status. And, um, and, and, and body weight, okay, in which the, the poorer, the less privileged, uh, certainly in the UK and the USA, the less privileged you are, the more likely you are to actually be living with obesity. And so that's a very, very uncomfortable link, but it is, but it is there. So, so that is gonna, gonna, gonna be the answer. As I said, at the, at the very, very top, every single trait, human trait and behavior, you might call it willpower, delayed gratification, um, you know, bad decision-making, um, Will have a will have a genetic influence. It is the role of the environment in question. What role does it actually have to play? So um, thank you again. Um, we do have um, another question, which is related to psychology. So mm -hmm. um, can psychological methods help with curing obesity? depends on your, it depends on why and how you behave around food, okay? So for example, there are some people who, uh, so I'll, I'll give you my Monday morning meeting scenario. Okay, the Monday morning meeting scenario, this is that I, I always use to actually describe feeding behaviors. We're all uh, in a Monday morning meeting, we're here, and someone decides to slide a plate of cookies across the table. I wanna argue that there are four different behaviors on these cookies, okay? They're the people who pick up the cookies before the plate has stopped, that's me. There are people who want to eat the cookie, but don't, but then as a result, ignore the rest of the meeting because they're fantasizing about the cookie. There are the people who don't even know the cookies have arrived. And those are very annoying people, my, I find. And there are the people who eat the cookies without even knowing they're having the cookies. They kind of eat, you know, like in front of the TV, suddenly you realize the whole, bu the, the whole bowl of popcorn's gone, gone. You haven't even enjoyed it at all. I think psychological approaches like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, group therapy, will work for certain classes of people, for, depending on your feeding behavior. I think it's less likely to work for people who feel more hungry all the time, certainly in the long term, because you can't fight that feeling of feeling more hungry all the time. Whereas you can, uh, it's very difficult, whereas you can actually think about cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, you know, to actually think, when am I eating? Am I enjoying what I'm eating? And I think those approaches are helpful in, that, in, in, in those scenarios. Thank you. I think um, this is probably a question which is um, of interest to many people because I mean, I myself 
see, I have been seeing recently um, advertisements about um, psycholo like an app or something using psychology, psychological methods to, to um, um, help people lose weight. So um, yeah, that's definitely a great, great answer. Um, with regards to leptin, there is a question asking if lep uh, is lep asking if leptin is affected in anorexia. Okay, so when I first started studying severe childhood obesity, that's what I started studying in, in, initially, we did think, people asked, and I think it was a fair question to ask, is anorexia nervosa the opposite of someone with leptin deficiency? Um, the answer, just to, just to put it in short, is no. Okay, and, and how do we know this? What we now know is that someone with anorexia nervosa appear to have all of the signals to tell their brain that they're starving, okay? Because obviously anorexia nervosa, you could end up very skinny, leptin levels do drop, but for whatever internal, and these are gonna be biologically driven reasons, they're able to ignore the signals. So leptin is still there, the various hormones that are supposed to indicate that uh, to make you eat because you're starving are there, but, but the, uh, there are gonna be genes and biology within the brain that actually allow them to ignore those signals. That is. Uh, I'm not an expert at anorexia, but that is my understanding of, 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 of that disease. So I guess this answers the other question that we had, which is basically, um, does leptin, leptin insensitivity occur in obesity? So leptin insensitivity. So what is leptin insensitivity? Leptin insensitivity is the concept of being, if, if the more fat you have, the more leptin you have, okay, right? And when you actually inject a human being or a mouse with no leptin, they eat less. How come obese people, people living with obesity with a lot of leptin and a lot of fat don't eat less? That is the concept of leptin resistance where there's a lot of leptin, but it's not signaling to the brain. It's a misunderstanding, I think, of the system because as I said, leptin doesn't function when there's lots of it around. Leptin functions when there's very little of it around. So I think it's a misunder... It, that's the concept of leptin resistance. There is a lot of it around, but that's because leptin's role is not to stop you eating, it's to make you eat when you're starving. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, basically, um, we do have a few more questions from YouTube. Mm -hmm. For example, um, um, given the various genetics involved in how much you eat, do you think it would be easier to encourage people to exercise more to tackle obesity instead of eating less? Thank you. And that's a very good, good question. You will notice that I spent the entire time talking about food intake and not about exercise at all. And, and that's not because I don't think exercise is important. Obviously it is. Okay. But actually, all of the genes which we have looked at and found have had have to do with food intake and at the moment, not to do with metabolism. Exercise increases your metabolism, not to do with your energy output. So the question is, why? Okay, So a couple of things. We know that exercise is not particularly good for weight loss if you don't take care of the food intake. Okay, It is, it is good for weight maintenance once you've lost the weight. But in of itself, the problem with exercising is it makes you feel hungry, okay? So therefore, and we, the concept, clearly if you exercise enough, you can lose weight. You look at a Tour de France cyclist, okay? They cycle, they eat 5,000 calories a day over the three week Tour de France race, but they still lose weight. But that's because they're Tour de France cyclists. Us mere mortals, we think we're Tour de France cyclists, but we end up running 5K and eating 10K worth of food. This is the problem. This is the issue. So now in terms of genetics, why haven't we found anything to do with metabolism? Okay, it's not because they don't exist. We know they exist. We know that there are some people that are more efficient than others. There are two reasons. Exercise, I mean, sorry, energy expenditure, including exercise, is more difficult to measure than food intake. Food intake, there is something physical to measure. Here's a piece of pizza. There is a weight I'm eating. When you're measuring energy expenditure, you have to measure two things. You have to measure... Um, uh, heat, that's one option, or you measure the changes in ratio between O2 and CO2, okay? So those require sealed rooms. So it's, it's possible on an individual basis, you know, in a research lab, but across millions of people, 
it's it's very difficult. So this is there's a measurement error. The second problem has to do with the fact that we're always more efficient with eating than we are with losing calories. Okay, it will always take me. No, it will. It, if I'm motivated, I can finish a Snickers bar, which is 240 calories, in less than a minute. Okay, and often I'm motivated, but it will always take me 20 to 30 minutes on a treadmill to burn it off. We are evolved to eat more efficiently than we burn the weight because that is, then we burn the calories because that is what has kept us alive. Maybe one or two more questions. Um, yeah, we, we have actually lots of questions on YouTube, but um, I think I'll pick two related to, uh, one more related to genetics and one more on um, psychology. Okay. So uh, the one on actually epigenetics. So the question yeah. is, do epigenetic modifications have a major role in one's body weight? Okay. I think the, the, the likely answer is it's going to be yes. But the epigenetic study of, these are good questions, the epigenetic study of body weight is in its embryonic state. Um, unlike the epigenetic studies of exercise or of some other diseases such as type 2 diabetes. Why? Okay, because epigenetics, to study epigenetics, just to, to, to precy, genes, genetics are there. Epigenetics are decorations on the genes, which then influences how those, how those genes are turned on and turned off. Okay, so in other words, it doesn't change your genes, but it, it alters the ability to actually, um, its expression. So it's the interaction between the environment and the genes, because your environment changes it. But as a result, epigenetics are two things. They're volatile. So they change with the environmental exposure, not super volatile, but they are. And secondly, they're tissue and organ specific, okay? They influence the organ in question. So in, in, in exercise, for example, you can, it's painful, but you can take out a little muscle biopsy and measure what happens with exercise. So we know a lot about that. For, for type two diabetes, you might look at fat. Maybe you can look at some pancreas that's more difficult to get, um, but you can look at peripheral tissues. Because of body, because body weight is primarily driven by the brain, we cannot legally, at least ethically, get into a human brain while we're still alive at the moment. And so now we can now get um, post-mortem samples and are beginning to get some kind of idea around that. But that's the reason why the epigenetics of body weight is so embryonic, because we can't get to the source tissue, which is our brain. And the last question? And um, yeah, so I think this is a, the last question is quite a, a nice one to round up the talk. So, okay. um, so which methods, if not psychological ones, would you advise trying to use with those who feel more hungry all the time? Folks, <laughs> if I could give you a straight answer, I'd be a very rich person and I wouldn't be here talking to you guys. Um, that's the $64 million question. And that's, that, that's the question that plagues us all. Okay. Because the, in order to lose weight, you need to feel less hungry. Okay. You need to feel more full. And so how do you therefore do that? And that is going to be the trick. And there are any number of different ways. Some ways is you can control the environment you can control, which tends to be your house. So if you know that you have a weakness for a specific type of food, Maybe don't ice cream, cookies, crisps, whatever it is you like to eat. Maybe don't have as much of it in the house. So, so if it's not there, you can't eat it. But how do you then survive the world? You can't do that. Okay, so clearly you have to go out and actually survive. Then you need to put together strategies to try and make yourself more, um, more full. Now, this is gonna di this is gonna differ from person to person. So I'm, I don't have a straight answer for you. But just for some for, for some examples. Okay, foods that are higher in protein. Protein is more satiating than other foods. Okay, calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat than a calorie of carb. So this is how some of the high protein diets that are out there work, right? More protein make, means that you eat, you, you, you're fuller. This doesn't work for everybody, but it'll work for quite a few people, okay? And remember that protein doesn't mean steak always. It can be tofu, it can be beans things like that okay so and the other thing which helps make you feel fuller is to eat food with more fiber okay and so and so that is another way of actually trying trying to do it I, that that's it that's a very short answer for an answer that requires a whole book in 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 order to answer but those are examples control the household your your household environment the best you can and when you're out try and put together a strategy to 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 so that you're prepared for any decisions that are coming, try to eat a little bit more protein and a hell of a lot more fiber. That's it. 
that's the shooting match, guys. Thank you very much. Um, so I think um, if there are no more questions, um, I would like to thank Dr. Zhao Xiu again for this very engaging talk. Um, and thank you everyone who participated um, and also asked questions. Um, so before we bring this to, a, to an end, I would just like to mention that we will have another talk our last talk this term next Thursday uh, by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is one of the who is one of the top one percent most cited neuroscientists. Um, and the top title is "Concept Construction in a Predicting Brain: An Emerging Paradigm to Unite Body and Mind." So perhaps for people who were asking lots of psychology questions, maybe you would be interested in the next talk. Um, so we'll round up the top um, now. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much, guys. See you later. Thanks for having me.